Okay, hey world schoolers, hey world schoolers. We are back with another one of our community expert interviews. And I couldn't be more thrilled about today. Um, in just a second, I'm gonna have Micah introduce herself. But Micah pitched me two specific topics and I couldn't decide. So we're gonna talk about both of them. So the first topic that she really has a great handle on is location independence, but working while you're on the road world schooling. And then the second one is time management with our children and managing education and learning. So both of those are really relevant to our audience and I hope that people are joining us for this conversation. Um, if you are here, uh, give us a like and, and let us know in the comments. I'm going to bring this up on my phone and I will be managing the uh, uh, conversation. So if you have questions while Micah is speaking, I will ask her and put them into the comments. And if you're watching this in uh, replay, please put hashtag replay so Micah knows that you are uh, engaged in this conversation. It's a really important conversation today. So let's jump right in. So Micah, tell us about your world schooling family. Thanks, Lainey. Hi, everybody. Hi, world schoolers. Um, so we're a family of American citizens, US citizens, um, two parents and three children. And we set out on our world schooling journey in 2015. We were living in Northern California and we decided that we would spend a year in Costa Rica. And very quickly that turned into now seven years of world schooling in all different <laughs> ways. Every, you know how it is. And a lot of you watching also know how that goes. Um, so both my husband and I are um, location independent workers. So we both have jobs that allow us to be anywhere as long as we have an internet connection. So we were fortunate to already have that when we started out. And um, during the time that we were traveling in the first two and a half years, um, it was basically a full-time travel situation. So we lived in Central and South America. We traveled in Europe. We lived in India. We traveled in Asia and also in Southern Africa. Um, so uh, um, about five years ago, we settled in rural France to try out homesteading in France. And then recently we moved to Strasbourg where our three children decided after five years of being out of schools to enroll in local public schools here in France. Okay, wow, okay. First question is why have our paths not crossed in person? <laughs> We've been, a we've been on the same path and, and you know, Central South America. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. We have a little bit. You know, in Peru, I think we, we tried to hook up in Peru many years ago. Um, and I think we were leaving when you were coming back. And so it just hasn't worked Gosh. out. Well, yeah. next time it's going to happen. Yes. It's going to happen. Um, so you've tried a variety of different education styles. Uh, why don't we jump into the education portion first? Okay. And since you mentioned that first you were traveling and being very nomadic, then you did the immersive experience. And you are uh -huh. in France now, as you said, right? Yes. Rural mm -hmm. France. And yeah. We're have, living in Strasbourg. Okay. And you, uh -huh. how long have you been there? Is, has that been from the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic, or did you relocate? So we relocated in um we relocated to france five years ago so we, we had been traveling for two and a half years and we decided one of our children i'm sure people can relate to this one of our children um was not keen on the constant motion and he really wanted to be a farmer so we decided to embark on a different sort of adventure and to then change our world schooling model to being short-term travel during um, you know a couple of weeks or a month at a time with a home base. It's so funny because when my son was about 14 or so, his interest in, in farming and all that really became deep as well. And so we went to farm after farm and learned how to harvest. And that was really a, an amazing experience for us. Yeah. But how do you deal with uh, addressing the learning process um, first when you were nomadic and uh -huh. and and then now. 
Um, so for through a variety of means, um, for one, I really like the Montessori approach of being very hands-on. And we didn't follow any particular curriculum. So I, I tried to work with whatever we had, and I try still when we travel, to work with whatever we have around us to develop a curriculum. But one of the things that I relied on um, during the time that I had three kids who were elementary school age and we were traveling full time was books like uh, what a first grader needs to know or what your sixth grader needs to know. There's a series of books that help me kind of keep track of what they would be doing in school and then to adapt what was in those books to what we were doing and, and what was around us. So I know a lot of world schoolers do that. Um, and I spent a lot of time kind of honing a technique that would involve a checklist for the kids. So kind of Montessori style um, saying, here are the tasks that you should do this week. And I would develop them on the basis of those books and what we were going to be seeing during that week. Um, and you manage your own time to get them done. So that was something that worked really well and that I took from the Montessori approach. But we also used lots of other lots of other learning techniques, including we immerse them in local schools sometimes and also in a democratic school in France. Oh, that's wonderful. Amanda is asking, how old are your children now? So now our children are 16, 13, and 10. When okay. we first left, they were two, six, and eight. Oh my gosh. So like mine, they are growing up on the road. This is the, the only life that they know, really. Yeah, especially I, the youngest. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I love that. So how much time does it take for you to adapt what they should know at a specific age to um, what their tasks are every week? How much time does it take from you as a parent? So it does take a fair amount of time. I mean, between the, my husband and I were both working. Um, we both work either part-time or full-time. Um, and then the actual planning of the trips, everyone knows um, where, where we're gonna stay next month um, and where we're gonna be always takes a lot of time. So it definitely takes me some time to do the planning and curriculum organizing. I would say I spend about five hours um, each weekend preparing for the three kids learning learning tools for the week. For the week, so that would be about, depending on the month, 15 to 20 hours a, a month of your yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. And, and you did mention that you let your kids manage their own time. How are they doing at managing their own time? So it has worked very well. And we tried different mechanisms. You know, sometimes it was like we imposed these two hours of the day that they need to do some reading and some semi-academic work. Um, and that did not work very well. So we, by, by giving them the checklist with specific tasks that they could do over the course of the week, it really allowed them to zero in on what they were interested in in a particular day. And I think that having three kids who are all kind of doing it also is helpful. And they weren't, they were never super academic tasks. I tried to link things directly to what we were doing. So for example, um, you know, math is always a little bit hard for, for me to integrate other than change and um, paying for things. But when we were at altitude in the Himalayas hiking um, and then snorkeling and diving in the Philippines, I was able to integrate altitude and calculation of pressure into their curriculum. And so I would give them a little reading or especially the oldest one at the time, a little reading on that. And then a couple of fun problems that would then be linked to what we were doing that day, going out and hiking in the Himalayas, for example. I love that. Okay, so to just to let people know that uh -huh. I'm using a bullet point list that Micah prepared for me to ask questions. I mean, that leads perfectly into what you are talking about in your adult learning principles. 
Um, can you yes. explain what that is and what your training for? You say that you have formal training in this. How can somebody, first of all, explain what it is and then how somebody who's watching this take your experience and adapt it to their own? Yeah. So I work in international development and I run projects on the ground in developing countries to help to empower um, poor women to create livelihoods and run businesses. Um, and so in the course of my work in this field, I was trained on adult learning principles. And the I think that the best resource on this is Jane Vela um, and Global Learning Partners, Jane Vela, V-E-L-L-A, um, who developed a, a series of, of um, documents and tools around adult learning. Uh, but some of the principles of adult learning are extremely relevant, I think, for any learning. And um, really, it tries to meet the learner from a place of respect and recognizing that they have some knowledge coming into this and we're not going to come and just impose knowledge on them, but rather try to help them think through what they already know and how it's worked and how they could apply it, maybe introduce a little bit of new information and then let them do something with it that's hands-on, that really engages them. And so I think that that's perfectly relevant to kids as it is to adults, because our kids, especially our kids who are out in the world, out and about um, exploring with their families, have so much to bring to the equation. They already are seeing so much and observing so much. So I like to try to meet them with that in mind, that they're going to bring something to the conversation and I'm not teaching them per se. I love so that. That's yeah, that's one of the, the factors. Another is just creating relevance, helping them see the connection between whatever, maybe there's something that's slightly academic or something that's been recommended that the kids learn, or maybe it's something, again, like math, like multiplication, help them understand where it's relevant in their life. So show them why it would be of interest to them to learn this and try to um, get them interested in that. So that's another of the adult learning principles that, that I provide. And it's also about dialogue-based education. So interacting and not just, again, uh, having it be a one-way street where they have to read something and that's it, or I say something to them. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think you just tapped in on the principles of world schooling. It's not a top-down approach. It's really an immersive experiential approach, and you really emulate that well with this technique. It's fantastic. I do have some questions that are not on your list. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. um, can you get down and dirty and let us know what happens if they don't meet their goals that week? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, there are some really tough days. Um, I think that, and I, I'm sure everyone can relate, I think the <laughs> toughest ones um, were when we were really trying to be super academic or trying to have them do a specific program. Um, but, and so what would happen on those days is that they just sort of whine and procrastinate and don't do it and none of us get to have any fun all day. Um, and so there would be days where we would end up in the evening not really having done any work at all, any of us, and not having gotten out, gone out and seen things that we wanted to see wherever we were. So there were actually definitely some bad days. Um, but I would say as we got into the groove of it, there were more good days than bad. Um, what would, by far. So what would happen if they... Um, didn't do their work was that they just wouldn't have certain um, privileges. We tried, we found that what worked best for us was to, for the parents to get up early in the morning and start our work, let our kids kind of roll out of bed and do whatever they wanted to do, and then get down into their work um, and then have a plan for something that we were all going to do at a certain time. Like at 2 p.m., if everybody's finished, we're going to go out and do this adventure together, or we're going to go have lunch together, or whatever. You know, we would have some sort of plan that was interesting. And so that was a motivator, or is a motivator to get them to do their work. I also think the checklist, um, for some reason, worked really well for my kids. And what would happen at the end of the week if they weren't able to check off all of the things that they were they had agreed to do that week is they just wouldn't get whatever the 
kind of prize was that week, whether it was um, to choose the family movie that we were all going to watch or to go out for ice cream or something, something like that. Ice cream. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. And again, so many different modalities of approaching education for families. And this one really seems to have worked for your family for all of these years. I love that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you coin as the magic of long-term world schooling themes? Oh, the themes. Yeah. So, um, at the beginning of our travels, I asked all of the all of our family members to identify something that they really were interested in, and that would be a kind of a thread through all of their their exploration around the world. Um, so my daughter chose traditional dance. She was interested in learning about traditional dances around the world, and one of my sons chose dairy farming because this is the son that was really interested in animals. Um, and so those two examples, I think the youngest one picked trains. Um, of but course. The, <laughs> so those two examples, we really went the furthest with because they were of an age where they were really engaged in finding out about that. So um, using those long-term themes was really exciting for us because it gave, and it, it, it just because it was chosen by a specific family member, uh, didn't mean that it was only that person who studied that. So all of us engaged together. And so we made a point of each place that we went, we tried to seek out ways to go see dance or take dance lessons or um, talk with dancers and musicians. So for instance, when we were in Granada um, in Spain, we did an experiential day with a flamenco dancer and we got to visit his home and he took us to a little, um, a little bar to see some flamenco up close and personal and talked with us and we did a little rhythm lesson. Um, when we were in Peru, we enrolled our daughter in dance lessons she specifically got enrolled in dance lessons and she went every day to learn the national dance of peru so nice. for a month she worked on that the, la mariana um <laughs> and she and i even got up we went to a big performance and they invited people up on stage so she and i got up and danced danced on stage to the traditional music and then we were in india living for four years and uh, uh four months sorry <laughs> i wish four years <laughs> For four months, um, we were there for six months, and for four months, she took dance lessons with a famous classical Indian dance guru, and uh, and I did as well. And so all of us um, traveled around in the region to go see temples so that we could perform temple dance in these temples. And um, we, we ended up dancing several hours a day for four months. So what that. was wonderful about that sort of theme is that we were able to compare across different countries and regions. Um, and the same with the dairy farming. And it sounds like you did similar things with your son we where we, we, you know, hopped around seeing how people do the milking. How do they handle the milking on family farms in Latin America, in Asia, in in Europe, um, how do they do it on factory farms? What do they do with the milk? Do they pasteurize it or not? And so we learned all of that together as a family and it led us down paths that we never would have come across otherwise. So true, yeah, we did farming, of course, in Peru. We did, we worked on an organic farm in Wales. We worked on a rice plantation in, uh, Indonesia, and we also worked in the rice fields a little bit in Thailand. So nice. like there is so much. And I've also worked with families before and introduced this idea of having these long term themes. I never called it that, but you know, it was always okay. the base interest. And uh -huh. I helped a family design a fashion tour <laughs> around the world. Oh, great. Yeah, nice. This girl who loved fashion. Another thing that my son was absolutely fascinated and loved was um, myth and origin stories. And that yes. can take you anywhere. Yes. It's yes. just helping your your young person to identify their interests and also having the flexibility when it changes. Yes, 
Absolutely. And it, it also helps the parent, I think, or the planner of the trip, because it really gave me something to focus on and say, okay, we're going to this location. What should we do? I mean, it was wide open. We could do anything, but let's see if there's anything that is tied to any of our family members themes and let's pursue those. And so it was a great way to plan the trip, also design the curriculum for their learning and, and have a great time together. And I love that you mentioned that it's a family uh, experience for the most part as well, mm -hmm. um, because you learn just by being in the vicinity of somebody who's learning and, and somebody who's into architecture may learn something from a dance recital because yeah in a theater that they would have never gone to or the the nature of the costumes is very architectural and there's right. different ways of looking at things through different lenses and we're all unique so i love that you tapped into this that 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 really lights me up but since you're talking about time management and our mm -hmm. kids learning can you give us some tips for time management and how to really keep the reins on that because we're going to jump into the location independent and working because we need to know that our kids are doing what they need to be doing so we can do what we need to do yeah yeah so we experimented with a lot of different things um one that i mentioned was that we did enroll them in local schools in costa rica in india um so we tried out enrolling them and it was in the local language so they were it was not really for academics it was more to have something to do and to learn the language a little bit and the culture um so we tried doing that which would allow um, my husband and me to both work while they were at at school um but otherwise we we did a lot of um unschooling weeks where we were just exploring with them um, but since we also, as parents needed to, to get work done, um, it was beneficial for us to give them these task lists to do. So we typically would have them, I, I really aimed to have them work no more than two hours a day on somewhat academic stuff and for that to be self-guided. Even the three-year-old was self-guided. I would give him tasks to do that were fun for him. Things like I would write a really si simple story like the cat has hat or something, you know, really, really easy. And he had to draw a picture of it. And so, and he had fun with that. So we would try to get blocks of time where they were all three occupied in some way for a couple hours so that my husband and I could work on our work. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go into this now, but there was also kind of a lot of playing around with things like having a traveling au pair with us. Um, we had a traveling au pair for a while. Um, it, there, we also tried, sometimes my husband and I were both working full-time. Sometimes we traded off um, with him taking days and me nights or vice versa. And sometimes we tried this, um, you know, four or five hour block and then all of us together exploring. So we tried lots of things. What worked really the best for us was having the mornings to get work done. And even if my husband and I had to get up really early while the kids were still asleep to get enough work in, um, having flexible jobs that allowed us to work not all the time with um, our team. So we could work at a different time. We could change our schedule around. Um, and then having something again, as I mentioned, for the kids and all of us to look forward to in the afternoon or evening so that it was a drive to get us all finished with our stuff and out the door. Right. Great, great, great. Um, there is a question from Anna. She asks, how many hours a day does each parent work and how many days a week? She says she's having a hard time trying to find balance. Um, the American 95 Monday through Friday just doesn't seem feasible, but my time management skills could use some improvement. What advice do you have for Anna? <laughs> we could all use some time and time management advice, right? I, I, I used to think that I was going to find this work-life balance and then I would achieve a balance and there I would be. This is what I was aiming for. And then I realized that it's just like balancing on one leg. You get it and then you fall out of it and then you're on and then you fall out of it. And the same is true for us in the world schooling and managing the work time. 
So um, as I say, we tried lots of formulas. It's hard for me to say exactly how many hours a day, but at some, sometimes both my husband and I were working eight hours a day. So when we had the au pair, that helped a lot. Um, if we had the kids enrolled in school, that also helped a lot. Um, at other times, I was, I'm a consultant, so I was able to work um, on projects kind of full on for a week where I was working maybe even 16 hour days. And then I was off for a week or two. So I was able to just, you know, ship the product and spend time with the kids and my husband and I could kind of trade off. But it is, it is such a challenge uh, to get into a routine, especially when your location is changing all the time and there's all this amazing stuff to see around you. So I feel the pain. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the pieces of advice and I don't want to jump ahead here, but one of the pieces of advice that I had to remind myself of all the time was manage your FOMO. So yeah. the fear of missing out was really hard for me. And I felt like when we were in Ecuador, for example, my husband and I were trading off. He was working about eight hours a day. I was working about six hours a day um, and weekends. And he would take the kids out and then, I, and I would work and vice versa. And every time I took the kids out, it was just a bust. It was the, the thing where every, you all know it, where you plan this whole day out and you get on a bus and you end up in some place that's all boarded up because it closed down and you didn't know. And then you go all the way across town to the other place and you go to this park and you get there and the kids are like, this sucks. So, you know, and then my husband would go out with them and have amazing adventures. And I was like, <laughs> but I had to just remind myself, okay, I, I'm making a sacrifice of not enjoying this or that with them, because if I didn't work, we wouldn't be able to keep doing this. So what's enabling us to be here and have the experiences we are is me sitting here in this dark spot working for three days straight. And so that was just kind of part of it when we were on the road full time. Yeah, yeah. And that does lead us right into the second half of our interview, which is how to work while world schooling. And I'm going to just add one more sort of thing that we did in our world schooling that helped mm -hmm. with that, the fear of missing out. When we decided that we would no longer have limits, to how long we were gonna be in a place. So we didn't have the feeling of scarcity. There was a scarcity of time. We had to see everything. We decided that we were gonna leave when we were ready. And sometimes it was two years, sometimes yeah. it was two months, but that took the pressure off. Okay, I'll get work done. You could play on your video games because you really like this video game. I know it's probably not your your trick, but he liked it. My son liked uh -huh. the video games and, and like he had his projects, like he had to do his projects. Right. So we all had our projects yeah. and it was okay that we were inside for two or three days because then we went outside for two or three days, you know? Mm -hmm. That to me was what our balance was, but it was that plus, we're, we don't have scarcity of time. We have yeah, not that's so time true. and that changes. Yeah. 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 And about regarding video games, that was also later on, um, more <laughs> when we settled down and the kids were a little bit older, that became one of the things that, and we still use this, um, they, they can play a video game at the end of the day if they've done all of the things that they need to do. And yeah. so that has worked really, really well for, for our family. And I know some really hate the video game thing, but that's, that's worked well as a carrot, you know, so that everybody yeah. wants to get their work done because they want to get to that. that Again, level. total different approaches. So whatever works for your family, yeah. right? like that's the best thing. You're talking to a radical end schooler here. So that's not <laughs> our approach, but I love that uh -huh. you found something that creates balance and order and it allows you to continue doing what you're doing and everybody f is on the same page. That works for me so much. So there's, yeah. you know. <laughs> so you must know democratic schooling. Too. Of course I do. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so we, we also had our kids in a democratic school for, for a year. Um, where it's, you know, it's completely child led. There were uh, activities that they could opt to do, but otherwise they were, they could do whatever they want if they right. wanted to go yeah. out and yeah. So I, I completely endorsed that as well. It was, that was great.
Again, there are so many different ways to world school as there are families. And this is part of the beauty of bringing experts with all these different experiences because I could never speak to your experience. It's just not mine. So I think you are speaking the language to somebody who's listening to this who needs to hear how you do things. And I'm really grateful that you've done that. So I want to make sure you know that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope it's helpful. I'm, yes. I'm really interested in sharing and hearing. I love participating in the group and hearing about others' experiences. So I'm glad to contribute and I hope it's helpful. I'm sure it is. All right. Well, let's jump into the important part, how to work okay. while world schooling. So you mentioned that you're a consultant. What is your husband? Uh -huh. So he's a programmer. Um, he's a computer programmer and he works on a team. So he has some flexibility. Um, his team is dispersed now all around the globe. Uh, during part of the time that we were traveling, though, he was working primarily with a North American based team. So that was fine when we were in Central and South America. But when we got to Europe, um, it or was Asia. Oh my God. Well, Asia, I know in some ways. Yeah. Eventually in Asia, we didn't get to stick around as long as we wanted because he was starting to just not be able to hack it. Um, yeah. So he was, his, he was sleeping during the day and working at night and we didn't really get to see him and he, he wasn't getting to enjoy much. So, um, but your, even Europe was a little tricky because he could never have dinner with us. He was always on, um, he was always on his calls. So it is kind of hard with managing um, time zones and it, he now has a distributed team. So everyone is kind of in the same boat and they have a couple times a week when they all have to be together to, to have a meeting and to work together. But otherwise he's got a lot more flexibility and he can work mornings or nights or whatever, whatever fits into our travel schedule. So now that your kids are older, you've got some teens, um, do you include them in the conversation about managing times and, time and accountability and responsibility? Is that part of the family conversation or is it just you and your husband that are having these conversations? I would say it's been a conversation with our whole family the whole time. So um, even when they were really young. Okay. And we would have family meetings every couple of weeks where we kind of all get together and talk about, okay, how's it going? What are you stressed about? What are you loving? What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? Um, so we really, we did a lot of that kind of discussion and they all understood from a really early age that mama and papa had to do our work and <laughs> they had their responsibilities um, and that that was just part of how we live together as a family. I love that. I really love that. That that was one of the techniques that my son and I used, which was an unpacking every, well, we did it every day, every night. Good for you. Wow. It's, it's hard, but it was our process to make sure yeah. that we were on the same page. But I love that you included everybody, even when they were really young. That's yeah. really helpful. And especially um, when we had a no pair, it was really helpful too, to just make sure everybody was on the same page because we didn't all see each other all the time. We usually had dinner together, but um, it was an opportunity for us to kind of also air frustrations with each other. I mean, when you're living in close quarters and traveling all the time, we all know that it can get stressful. So that was a really helpful, a helpful tool for us too. So what are some of the other tools that you use for balancing work, accountability, responsibility among all of the family members and learning education? What are what are your management tools, time management tools and um, strategies? Well, um, I think, did I have bullet points on this? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. You have, you have numerous approaches down at the bottom. <laughs> I'm setting you up <laughs> to answer you. What are my approaches again? Um, <laughs> so um, I think I think I've touched on a lot of them. Um, but one of the one of the things that has really helped is just making sure that we have local community everywhere we go, um, Im immersing ourselves into the local community so that the kids can make friends and we can too, and we can get a window into the environment. Um, and then it also helps us to kind of have a community of people to 
to rely on and to provide moral support and help them and help help our kids um, have time away from us and with other people. So I know that there are a lot of world schoolers in this group who um, go to hubs. And I think it's so cool that that has arisen and that, that there are hubs all over the world. Um, and so that's not something that we did at the time that we were traveling full time. And we, we really tried to look for ins into the local community. And that ended up being a helpful time management technique because we could have kids over that they got to know so that they were all occupied and having fun while we could get a little work done or um, maybe even find a babysitter or have the kids um, spend some time with friends so that my husband and I could go out and do something that the kids wouldn't want to come along for. I love that. I, this isn't on your list, but I have a question. How did you manage the goodbyes? I mean, the, that was always whenever we made deep, deep connections in a community that we stayed in for a year, the goodbyes yeah. were always the hard part for us. What about uh -huh. you? How did you manage that with so your- So hard. I think that's why I had the Freudian slip of living in India for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, we were only there for six months, and that was one of the hardest goodbyes um, I've had. We really, we were there for a long enough time that we really made some deep friend friendships, and um, we had a lovely community there, and we loved our lives there. So yeah, the goodbyes are so hard, and it's one of the reasons that my son, who's who was a teen by that point, almost a teen by that point, um, wanted to stop traveling. He just couldn't stand that heartache of making friends and then having to having to leave. So that was one of the factors in us deciding to try world schooling from home um, and from a fixed from a fixed location. Yeah. Well, I think the information that you shared is so valuable. Will you share with everybody who's watching what you're working on, what you're doing? Uh, I know you have some world schooling, some projects um, that you're working on. You want to share what they are? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, I, so I actually uh, broke my leg while traveling um, in, in Lisbon, freak accident, and it was our first trip after the pandemic, or after, I mean, as the pandemic was getting to a stage where we could travel again, um, and so I, on the third day, I broke my leg, and I thought, oh, well, just, you know, get surgery here, and then I'll be back up and running, but it turned out to be a really serious accident and break. So I was bedridden for four months. Um, and so that was earlier this year. And I am a, like a lot of people here, and I know you are, Lainey, I'm a mover, I'm a shaker, I got to move, I got to have new stuff. And so I was just about going crazy um, after just a couple of days. And so I decided that I had all of these pictures and experiences and lovely um, blogs and things that I had kind of had to leave on the side while I was doing my work and we were traveling and whatnot. And that this was a perfect opportunity for me to kind of make a silver lining out of my accident and document um, some tools and write a book about our trip and try to also just share some things with the community of world schoolers that they might be interested in. So hoping that some of the experiences that we have could inspire people to come up with their own ideas to, to um, help enrich their families' travels and adventures too. So I started a website that's called Taranga Tribune, T-E-R-A-N-G-A, -A, which is a Wolof word. I lived in Senegal and learned the Wolof language there. And Taranga is a concept that it's a very important value in Senegal about openness of spirit, generosity, and respect for others, um, and just this loving of others. And so I started the Taranga Tribune as kind of a project in that spirit to share our experiences, both because I think they're beautiful and fascinating and sometimes harrowing, but also because I really want it to inspire other people to tackle this kind of lifestyle. So um, I started Taranga Tribune website. I wrote a book that's not yet published. Um, I hope people are interested enough in some of these other resources that I'll be able to publish the book. And I started a podcast and it's called Taranga Tribune Travel Talks. And if people are interested, they can go to the website and find all of my handles and, um, and tools and podcasts and, and whatnot. 
And I'm going to invite you to put your links into the comments of, of our okay. video, of our chat, because I think it's really, really important. I am so excited for this project and in Thank the you. spirit of giving an inspiration and hope and respect, I hope you're super successful. <laughs> so Thank you. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, oh. I just... Awesome. You put it in the Zoom chat. Oh, I'm sorry. happy you I'll put, put it in into the Facebook chat because okay. I'll, I'll put it in after. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And um, before we wrap up, I'm going to invite anybody who's watching. There's a bunch of people watching now. If you have any questions uh, for Micah, put them into the chat now. And Micah, are there any final thoughts that you want to share with world our world schooling community? Well, the five tips that I have for people who are trying to work on the road, and they're, I think they're pretty obvious, but they really helped us just kind of keep track of what would let it work for us, um, are first of all, of course, internet, 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 and it did, <laughs> not, it did not always correspond with what I expected. Like the best internet we ever had was on a mountaintop in Nicaragua in a, a an organic coffee farm that was all solar run. And for, I guess, because we were on the top of the mountain, the internet was great. So we extended oh our God. stay because we were able to, my husband was working a lot at the time and I, and he was able to get lots of work done. Where so was internet. that? What city? That, it was outside of Maragalpa, about 45 minutes outside of Maragalpa. <laughs> and it was the Finca Esperanza Verde. It's gorgeous. Oh. Um, so I, I highly recommend. Okay, um, good. So secondly, slow travel. And as you mentioned, um, not having a time, uh, a deadline to leave. Now we often did, but still at least we made sure that we had a full weekend minimum in a place with a week on either side so that we could enjoy time together on the weekend at least. Nice. Um, and a month or more was better. Third, local kids activities that I've touched on, um, whether it was local schools or enrolling them in extracurricular activities, um, not that they were in school, but other kids were, so that way they would have a chance to interact. Fourth, work flexibility, if you can possibly make your job more flexible so you can work weird hours and uh, work more for uh, a week and then off for a week. And finally, the manager FOMO tip, managing your fear of missing out and realizing that you've got to be doing the work most likely if you want to be able to keep traveling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have any questions. I want to thank Amanda and Anna and, and Tanya and Christine and uh, I, oh, Ta Tanya and Lisa for watching. So <laughs> thank you. Thank guys. you all for watching. And, and if you have questions, um, if there's anything that sparks your interest about Taranga Tribune um, that you see or you would like to see more of, I would really love some some questions, and I'd be happy to answer them in the in the chat um, or online through our, my next articles. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, thank you, I Lainey. said, and if you're watching and have questions and you're watching this in replay, please do put hashtag replay and it'll uh, let Micah know that you have a question for her. Okay. Thanks, thank Lainey. Thanks, everyone. Happy travels. Happy travels, everybody. And we're out.